Wow, you're zipping through space in a large ship as big as three New York City Central Parks. There's a lot of commotion going on. No, it's not some alien invading the spaceship. It's a very important day. The date is January 22nd, 2700. You've just been born outside of the Earth's atmosphere. Happy birthday! There's a medical team attending to everything. Futuristic gadgets help out with every aspect. And the view from the giant spherical glass ship is nothing but the incredible vastness of space. You can't even see Earth anymore. The spaceship is flying to a new destination millions of miles away. ETA on reaching that new host planet? Decades. Fast forward a bit. You're 25 years old. And this spaceship's the only home you've ever known. (laughs) So far. You've learned all the ins and outs of the ship. You start your day in your dorm, which has all the essentials. A small compact bathroom, a mini kitchen, a bunk bed, and a magnificent view of the stars and planet outside the ship's reinforced glass. And you never need to worry about space radiation. The ship has an everlasting magnetic shield that reflects space radiation, so it doesn't seep its way onto the ship. Otherwise, there'd be big problems. The ship was designed to have artificial gravity. Astronauts normally lose 1-2% to of their bone density every month they're up in space, since they're just floating around all the time. But now, I mean in the future, in deep space travel, they're able to solve this problem. You make your way out of your dorm and see a wave of fellow crew members making their way to work. They're all gliding through on their advanced mini hoverboards, and everyone's wearing different colors, a space-age uniform. Yours is blue, so you hop on your board and join the blue wave. You get to the underpass of the space transport and begin your work. As an engineer on board, your job is super important, maintaining the ship and keeping it running. But something's wrong. Numbers are flashing all over the panels, and the dreaded red light won't stop blinking. You alert your coworkers, but they don't know what's happening either. Quick! You keep checking the logs and all the complicated equations, but nothing adds up. Panic starts to spread throughout the ship. The hair on your arms is standing on end. You try to click on as many buttons and switches as you can. The buzzing keeps getting louder and louder. The light is flashing brighter. Some of your colleagues make a break for it, and you're all alone in the red room. Suddenly, finally, your supervisor rushes down to help. After a while, the two of you figure it out. Whew! That was close. You still have a lot to learn about managing the ship. Since your early years, you were assigned to work as an engineer. You were great at physics, chemistry, math, all those sciencey things. It's just another day in the office. But on this ship, you may make captain one day. After work, you get a call from your friends wanting to hang out. And when I say call, I mean a phoneless device that lets you communicate with anyone while seeing all their info through a hologram projection that only you can see. You can also use it to listen to old tunes from Earth. Pop music has now become classical music, and movies are now 3D projections of your own imagination. You make your way out of the underpass and go up to the space plaza. That's where everyone hangs out when they have time off. Some cafes, restaurants, a barber shop, even an ice cream parlor. You've never hung out anywhere else. The space transport is essentially a small city, which has all the important things society needs. That includes a biosphere full of animals and plants from different climates on Earth. Many tropical forests, many deserts, many rainforests, you name it. The biologists on board make sure to keep it all healthy, so you feel like you're at home. Not that you've ever set foot on Earth. You enter the wild savanna and see some gazelles galloping around. A few wildebeest seem to be rummaging around, and a small pack of lions are on the prowl. In the jungle, you feel the humidity and the thick leaves and bushes all around. Some mountain gorillas are playing, and there are little tree frogs here and there. And lurking in the trees, making its way down for a sip of water, is a jaguar. Over in the dry desert, you see some roaming camels, a little rattlesnake slithering its way out of the heat, and some little scorpions crawling around in the sand. You learned a whole lot of biology these last 25 years. You know all about Earth, but you've never been there. Weird. After the tour of nature's habitats, you hear an announcement on the PA. It's the captain. The new planet is hours away, earlier than anticipated. 
Everyone, assume positions for landing. Everyone on the ship rushes to the dormitories, except the key crew members needed to run the ship. You strap into your bunk bed that turns into a seat with fancy interstellar seatbelts. You look out your window and see a blue dot in the distance. It gets bigger and bigger, and it looks a whole lot like Earth, from far away at least. That didn't take all that long, only 25 years. Wonder what's going under the hood of that spaceship. You look back at your life in space, knowing this first part of it is coming to an end. It's kind of like living at the South Pole. At the bottom of the world lives a small community of scientists who work between winter and summer doing all kinds of research, from climate and geology to meteorology and astronomy. Their lives must be similar to living here in outer space. They have their own bunkers, scientific labs, and even recreational rooms for sports and music. The nature on the planet you're approaching is unlike anything on Earth. Tropical trees soaring higher than the highest skyscrapers. Oceans that are so wild, there are hurricanes that last for years, just roaming about. The pilot announces the landing. It's all good. Time to get to work. You unstrap yourself and head outside to see the new planet for yourself. Walking on land feels like, well, like arriving on a new planet. The humidity is thick and the wind is warm. The ship landed on the tropical side of the planet, where studies show is the best place to begin a brand new settlement. It's not going to be easy. Humans usually begin new settlements next to lakes and rivers. Think of the Mesopotamians, the ancient Egyptians, the Aztecs. The list is endless. They began as small settlements until they grew to be fully functioning mega-civilizations. By trading and exploring, they were able to advance their technology, learn new languages, and discover awesome cooking recipes. Hey, I could go for some pasta and sushi right about now. According to scientists, being born in space could alter the way humans look. Human heads could be bigger within thousands of generations. Who knows? There's no way to simulate it on Earth. We can even have different new skin colors, since we would need more melanin, that pigment stuff that protects us from sun radiation. Being closer to the sun or any hot burning mass of fire might mean we'd produce more or different kinds of melanin to protect us. We might turn dark brown, purple, gray, or even green. You wake up, gasping for air, struggling to peel yourself from your bed. When you do manage to get your feet on the ground, it feels like they're glued down tight. You're twice as heavy. It feels like you're carrying another you on your shoulders all day long. Well, congratulations. You've woken up on an Earth where uncontrolled experiments with dark matter have doubled the force of gravity. Mass panic happens when over 8,000 aircraft fall as soon as the gravity spikes, crashing into buildings, forests, and oceans. And that's because airplanes suddenly lost the balance between the pull of gravity and the lift force necessary to keep them cruising. Pilots did attempt to save their planes, but GPS failed as satellites swiftly moved. After a month, humans begin to look more and more like chimps. Bones are getting thicker, and the immense force constantly pulling people down is squashing their spines, making everybody bend over. People start figuring out that walking ape-style on all fours helps with better balance and stability. And that becomes a big deal, since even tripping over a tiny rock could lead to a nasty fracture. Falls not only get more intense due to the extra forces on bones and joints, but they also happen faster. Gravity's pull doubles the acceleration force, increasing it from 32 feet per second to 64 feet per second. Your house is not a safe place anymore. Old buildings and bridges all over the world are now collapsing. Inside those still standing, Residents get the scary feeling that the whole place is shaking, and cracks start showing up everywhere. It's dangerous to stay inside houses, as roofs are now twice their usual weight, and any rain or snow also feels twice as heavy. Car alarms are constantly going off because tree branches keep falling all over the place. Most trees simply can't bear the weight of gravity, and only strong and small plants survive, like cactuses and succulents. Six months after the sudden change, supermarkets have a sinister vibe going on, with shelves nearly empty and people arguing over the last loaf of bread. You get frustrated to see that your favorite Japanese restaurant is now five times more expensive. 
And it's not just about salmon prices. It's rice that has become a rare luxury item, since the gravity boost has messed up the photosynthesis process, and the seeds are taking too long to grow. On the flip side, carrots are now cheaper than ever. They're sprouting and growing at lightning speed. People start eating so many carrots that human skin now has an orange glow from all that extra beta-carotene. Farmers are getting creative, using artificial supports to keep plants like tomatoes and corn on their feet. But even with all their efforts, it's hard to get a good harvest. Summer has arrived, and even your air conditioner can't relieve the unbearable heat. A sudden change in gravity disrupted Earth's orbit around the Sun, pushing it into a new, tighter elliptical path. Earth now passes much closer to the Sun than it used to, making your sunscreen simply surrender. The Moon's orbit has also had some dramatic changes, leading to more dangerous and extreme tide patterns. High tides are now higher, and low tides are lower. This shift has also triggered widespread volcanic eruptions and earthquakes on an unprecedented scale. Earth's crust starts to rupture across vast areas, unleashing planet-wide lava flows so intense that living on Venus begins to sound like a pretty good idea. Five years later, people notice that puppies are begging for food twice as much, but they are taking more time to grow. Breeds like beagles look thinner, and their leg bones are getting heavier. Even insects, such as locusts, now have thicker hind legs to keep those jumps going. Sea creatures are being crushed by the much greater weight of the water around them. It's not a big deal for animals used to deep ocean pressures, like the anglerfish. But crabs and lobsters are really struggling since they live in shallow waters. Sloths and monkeys develop a stronger grip so they won't fall off trees. For carnivorous animals living in jungles or savannas, life is a real challenge because any animal the size of a wolf or bigger can't run without breaking a leg. Large predators like lionesses are starving because they can't move fast enough to catch their prey. Tall trees like palms and pines also go through evolutionary changes. They get beefier trunks and only grow about half as tall as usual. This way, water and nutrients can travel from the ground up to their leaves without struggling against gravity so badly. Ten years have passed since gravity increased. Airlines have finally made changes to prevent commercial flights from nosediving. The wings of airplanes are now longer. Pilots have learned to fly at altitudes twice as high and flight speed has increased by 41%. To avoid people getting extremely nauseated and dizzy during takeoffs and landings, seats are now fully horizontal, like first-class bed-like setups, specially designed to minimize the nasty effects of gravity times two. Flight attendants are trained to raise the seat at the passenger's feet after they pass out, so that blood can return to their head. The thing is, when gravity gets a power boost, it yanks your blood down to your feet and hands even more than usual, making your heart work extra hard to pump that blood around, especially to your head. Now, let's pretend that humanity faces a huge threat from outer space. So we'll imagine that a uh, giant planet-eating octopus comes to our solar system to eat uh, Venus, Mars, Earth, um, Jupiter, and other planets, except Saturn. Therefore, people decide to move to the big planet with giant rings. Fortunately, they already have cool technologies that allow them to make such trips. So we get into giant ships, take off, and fly to Saturn. Life on the planet itself is impossible because it has no solid ground. The ship won't be able to land there. This is a giant gas ball that is nine times wider than Earth. To compare their sizes, look at a five-cent coin and a baseball. And the planet's atmosphere consists mainly of hydrogen and helium. So if the ship starts to land, it'll never reach solid ground. And the lower it goes, the higher the pressure it will experience. Eventually, the ship will just be crushed. Therefore, we have only one choice. The rings of Saturn. They're made up of giant, medium-sized, and tiny particles of ice and rock flying around the gas giant at tremendous speed. They were formed from comets flying by. Saturn's gravity knocked these celestial bodies off their course and crushed them with its pressure. Fragments of these comets began to accumulate around Saturn, forming rings. Now, some of these particles fly faster, some are slower. The closest to the planet is the D-ring. 
It's followed by rings C and B. Then there's a large gap called Cassini division. Rings A, F, G, and E come after. This classification is very convenient for creating a ring map. So people approach the rings, but don't dare to land on them. First, they send test capsules with robots to scout the area. The robots choose a suitable location on the E-ring. In fact, the distance between the rocks is quite large, and the ship can easily fly there. There are tiny particles, huge rocks the size of houses, and comets the size of a whole mountain. The first robot flies up to a large rock at high speed. At this moment, a baseball-sized stone pierces the robot's body. Another robot gets smashed between two colliding boulders. The third robot gets caught in a rain of sharp icicles and breaks. People have big engineering workshops on their ships, so they build new capsules and new robots. This time, they're made of more durable materials, so the robots reach a big rock again. A few particles crash into them, but don't break through the armor. The machine set up a small station on a flying rock where people can live. But after a couple of hours, a big chunk of asteroid smashes the station. Well, seems like we need another strategy. Giant ships scan the entire area of the E-ring and calculate the trajectories of billions of stones. After lengthy calculations, people finally find the perfect places in the middle of this chaos that will stay intact for a long time. They land on these large rocks in their capsules and begin to settle down. They build stations and small houses and install powerful batteries on them. Saturn is located at a distance of 9.5 astronomical units from the Sun. One unit is the distance from the Sun to Earth. So Saturn is a pretty cold place. That's why there's so much ice flying around it. But how to get the energy to heat it all up? There's too little of it on large ships. Besides, solar panels are ineffective here because of the great distance from the sun. Therefore, scientists create a way to generate kinetic energy from flying stones. It's like a windmill. When the wind drives the fans, these movements are converted into energy. So engineers build panels that collect power from the moving stones. But it doesn't slow the speed of rocks down because Saturn's gravity continues to move them. Thus, people receive a source of almost limitless energy. Some space stations have plants and trees that produce oxygen through photosynthesis. Only instead of sunlight, they get energy from ultraviolet. Then people fill large tanks with oxygen and carry them to their homes. People begin to occupy the adjacent rings. You don't need a lot of fuel to get from one place to another. You can land on a rock, calculate its route, and wait for it to bring you to the needed point. Then you can move to another one, and so on, until you reach your destination. More and more people leave their ships and move to the rings. It seems that life is getting better, but then psychological problems begin. Constant movement in the vacuum of space drives everyone mad. Imagine living on a carousel that never stops. You can't walk to the store whenever you want because it always flies away. No one can go out for a walk, even in a spacesuit because there's a chance to come across a rock flying at high speed. You can't plan anything because, at the moment, your plans can be ruined by a giant piece of ice. Computers don't help either. They can't calculate the trajectories of all space bodies. Rocks tend to break and split into hundreds of smaller ones. Also, new comets fly by and also become part of the rings. All this creates uncertainty and causes a sense of anxiety in people. Besides, it's dark, cold, and very lonely on the rings. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side.